What do you think of when I say artificial intelligence? Is it something like this? <laughs> or maybe this? Or something more like this? Artificial intelligence, or AI, is a subfield of computer science which enables intelligence exhibited by machines. And even experts disagree about what exactly defines AI. But uh, usually they can agree that if something exhibits intelligence, if it interacts with its environment in complex ways, then we can generally call it AI. How many of you thought of this when I said artificial intelligence? I work in the White House in the Office of Science and Technology Policy. And the hand on the left belongs to our president, Barack Obama. The hand on the right belongs to a paralyzed man named Nathan Copeland, who's using a brain-computer interface to actually control and feel that robotic arm with his mind. The Office of Science and Technology Policy works on some pretty amazing things on behalf of the president, the US government, and the American people. I have people in my office who are working on policy matters related to energy and the environment, cybersecurity, nanotechnology, biotechnology, and much, much more. And my policy portfolio focuses on artificial intelligence and robotics. So I get to wake up every morning and craft policy related to AI, machine learning, and technology platforms like automated vehicles and drones. You can think of this talk sort of as Schoolhouse Rock with a Jetsons twist. <laughs> In 2016, uh, the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy started a uh, policy process around artificial intelligence called the White House Future of AI Initiative. We uh, hosted a series of public events, five across the country, and we solicited public input on all different topics related to AI. Back in October of 2016, we published a significant public report on the future of artificial intelligence and a companion national AI research and development strategic plan. The almost 70-page AI report was a big deal, primarily because it's really the most significant thing the White House has ever said about AI. And it's not the first time that the White House has awoken to the issue of artificial intelligence. Um, obviously, this technology has existed for a while now. Though, though the decade, sorry, <laughs> though, uh, Though the field of AI has existed for several decades, recent progress in AI has been driven by three primary factors that have built upon each other. The availability of big data, which in turn has helped power uh, more sophisticated algorithms and machine learning techniques, and in turn has relied upon faster computing infrastructure. Policymaking is a process of radical collaboration, and the AI policy process for us was no different. It is a synthesis of, uh, of complex ideas, both drawn from within and outside of the government community and across the country. We had thousands of people tune into our AI workshop series. We spoke to people across the public and the private sectors, experts in a variety of different fields, and people from all different disciplines and backgrounds. The public, the White House heard about artificial intelligence, and it was via meetings, phone calls, emails, and even faxes, yes, really faxes, from American constituents all across the country and even across the globe. The Obama administration heard about artificial intelligence, and today I'm gonna talk about a few key takeaways from the lessons that we learned. The first is that we have an imperative to use AI. One of the most common things we heard from people, whether they were public citizens or experts in the field, was that it is critically necessary that we responsibly develop and deploy as much artificial intelligence as we possibly can. Jason Furman, the chair of the President's Council of Economic Advisors, said that his biggest worry about AI was that we don't have enough of it. Other experts argued that people are actually dying today because we aren't deploying AI in settings where we know it can help save human lives. It's not AI that will bring on the end of humanity, they said, but the absence of these technologies that is already killing people and costing lives, citing you know, medical errors and uh, ineffective disease treatment as areas where we can employ machine learning techniques 
to save people's lives. In healthcare, AI is helping us predict, treat, and, uh, and help develop patient care. In one example, AI is being used to process vast amounts of oncological data to create a complete map of pancreatic cancer so that we can better target these processes with treatment mechanisms that can more effectively enable cancer treatment. AI is also helping us save our planet. Researchers are creating an autonomous computational system called WildBook, which helping biologists track and evaluate animals for conservation purposes across the globe. Using image recognition techniques and crowdsourced publicly available images of all sorts of wildlife across the world, we can actually identify and track individual animals like zebras, elephants, and whales. And this can help us reduce the incidence of illegal poaching. It can help us conserve endangered populations and can also help us better learn about the species with which, which, with which we share our world. And importantly, AI can also help us impact vulnerable populations by providing critical assistance in social challenge areas like poverty and education. In one recent example, a school district in Tacoma, Washington, partnered with a tech company to develop a machine learning model that helped analyze student and historical data to predict which students were most at risk of dropping out of school and prompt early intervention. And after a multi-year pilot of that system, they actually were able to boost graduation rates from 55% to 78% in just four years. AI is impacting all areas of society, and it's clear from these examples and many others that that's the case. We also learned that it's critical for everyone to develop and benefit from AI. It's a pretty normal day if I am one of the only women in a lot of my meetings. And that story isn't new, not in the tech sector and certainly not in the field of computer science. Unfortunately, the field of AI is even more homogenous. Today, just 18% of graduates in computer science are female, down from a peak of 37% in 1984. And the field of AI is even less diverse. At a recent Neural Information Processing Systems Conference in 2015, which is one of the largest conferences on AI research in the world, just 13% of participants were female. Blacks, Latinos, and members of other ethnic and racial minority groups are also severely underrepresented compared to their shares of the US population in STEM and the tech workforce, and certainly in the field of computer science and the subfield of AI. As machine learning techniques, become more ubiquitous, and we use them more and more in everyday life to replace human decision making, it becomes increasingly important for us to get this technology right. Last year, users of a popular photo app, which automatically applied tags to digital photos and albums, discovered that it was actually classifying uh, images of black people as gorillas. Machine learning often reflects biases that exist in everyday life. In this case, it was fundamentally a data problem, but it also impacts algorithms and the outputs of AI systems. It is critically important, and we all have a responsibility, for us to ensure that AI systems reflect diverse populations, and that we help reduce the negative impacts of narrowly focused AI development and unintended biases in AI systems. The third lesson that we learned is that understanding AI can be hard, but is deeply important. I don't know if any of you have seen this video of a robot named Atlas by Massachusetts firm Boston Dynamics, but uh, for those of you who haven't, it depicts a robot stumbling through a snowy field with more dexterity than somebody like me probably could, and uh, getting pushed over by a person only to spring back up again with an almost disturbing resilience. When this video came online last winter, I got a call from my grandfather, who had never before talked to me about policy matters related to my job. What are you doing about this robot, he said, uh, as though it had personally affronted him somehow from the computer screen on which he was watching it. I think this video was an important lesson for a lot of people, because it made especially salient the 
uh, current state of technology. But it was also a critical lesson for me in my position at the time because it also helped me realize the potential disconnect that exists between the people working on the science and the policies behind these technologies and everyone else. And it turns out that people vary in how well they understand AI. In a recent global consumer survey by Weber Shanwick and KRC Research, over under 20% of uh, global survey participants actually said that they understand a lot about AI. And over 30% actually admitted to not knowing anything. So you're not alone if you don't really understand this field of technology. Interestingly though, despite of this, we are pretty positive about the overall impact of artificial intelligence. 45% of us think it's gonna be positive and only 7% of us think it's gonna be negative. And 52% of consumers believe that AI will have a positive impact on their lives personally. The fourth lesson that we learned is that agile government is critically important to the responsible development of artificial intelligence. Over the course of the development of the AI report, we learned a lot of things, but this was perhaps the most salient. There are many areas where it doesn't seem like government has direct influence over AI as it's related to governance issues, but this is actually not the case. Today, the government's making policy decisions about AI that actually impact the way that this technology is developed and will be used in every, everyday circumstances like people like me and you. And there's no area where this is more relevant than in intelligent transportation, which is an area that my policy portfolio focuses intently upon. Last month, we had US Transportation Secretary Anthony Fox come in and talk to us about uh, intelligent transportation platforms. And when asked how many questions he had received over the course of his confirmation hearing on either automated vehicles or drones, the answer he gave was zero. And that was three years ago in 2013. This highlights the critical importance that policymakers uh, keep in mind the current state of technology and keep up with the pace of it in developing policy and regulatory issues related to it. Neither issue is on the map, he said. My concern has been that we're moving into the Jetsons era, but we have, a Flint, we have Flintstone approaches to authority and regulation, and we can't go the distance with this until we really think about things differently. Transportation policy is something we took a deep look at when we were writing the administration's AI report. And there are several reasons for it. The first is that transportation affects everybody. If you ever drive in a car or have ridden an aircraft to get from point A to point B, if you are an owner or operator of one of the seven million drones projected to be in US airspace by 2020, this policy area affects you. When we were developing the AI report, one of the biggest lessons, as I mentioned, was that we keep in mind the pace of technology. Automated vehicles have the potential to save almost all of the 35,000 deaths caused a year by traffic accidents and to totally transform the way that we organize our communities and allocate our time. Autonomous aircraft systems are already changing the ways in which we observe and conserve our environment, helping us save lives and inspect critical infrastructure. It's increasingly important as technology helps enable these critical social changes that we help enable it equally from the perspective of the government. I wanna end with a focus on one critical question which informs everything that we do. It's scrawled on a whiteboard in our office actually. And that question is, how does government keep the future in the present tense? At the beginning of this talk, I spoke of the notion of radical collaboration which existed between policymakers and the public community that we are affecting. And I want to underscore how critical it is that policymaking remains a team building process. That means that everyone has to have a seat at the table. It's more than just bureaucratic optimism that I'm saying this. We literally cannot do it without you. We need academia, industry, and experts in a variety of different communities to step up and provide leadership in educating the American public and the next generation of innovators about the importance of AI for good. We need the advocacy community, the media, and people from a wider range of other backgrounds to hold developers accountable to AI systems so that they responsibly represent the needs of a diverse variety of populations. We need more women and underrepresented minorities to go into STEM fields and the AI disciplines. And we need more people to reflect more often about how these technologies impact policymaking on a regular basis. We need all of you. Artificial intelligence has incredible potential. If only we all work together to unlock it. Now more than ever before, 
We need people from all backgrounds and all disciplines to show up, engage with each other and with their government, and help us craft a more inclusive, forward-leaning future, which helps move us all in the right direction. Thank you.